Okay, welcome. I am here pleasantly surprised and honored to have the three of you available to chat with me today. I know it's a busy time of year and there's so much going on right now um, with the pandemic, but thank you. We are welcoming executive team from the Guelph Nighthawks of the Canadian Elite Basketball League. We have Cameron Cush, the president, Dylan Howe, VP of um, Business Operations, and Nicole Greco, Senior Manager of Membership Services. It's also my pleasure to state that these three individuals are Brock Sport Management alumni as well. Cameron graduated in 2005, Dylan graduated in 2018, and Nicole graduated in 2013 and also continued her education at Brock and completed her master's in 2016. So welcome and thank you again for being here with me today. No problem, thank you for having us. So as I stated before, we're going to run through just the five panel questions that um, were pre-established. And then after we're done going through each of you um, having a chance to respond to those, I'll open it up to some of the questions that we received from our student, um, student group prior to this session. So first, very generally, can you give us a brief overview of your path um, to the position that you currently have with the Nighthawks? And I'll start with Dylan just going in uh, counterclockwise here. <laughs> Yeah, no, no problem. Uh, my, my path was a little bit unique. Like, as you mentioned, uh, I graduated in 2018. So again, come out up on uh, three years ago. So for me, um, it all kind of started when I went back to school uh, for the second time around in 2016. Um, during that time, the Niagara River Lions, which some of you may be familiar with, um, because, because they are now playing in our league in the CEBL, um, the River Lions were playing in the MBLC, which is a league that is still currently um, active today. Uh, my good friend, um, friend of mine from my hometown. So again, uh, networking is huge as you'll hear throughout, um, or I've already heard throughout your university career. Um, a good friend of mine, Josh Knusser is now the, the v VP of the league. Um, he and I grew up together. And so when I went to school at Brock in 2016, he offered me a position with the, with the River Lions working game days. So I ended up being their game day coordinator for, for two seasons. Um, during that time, uh, the CEBL and, and the Guelph Nighthawks were, um, were a thought, um, and they became a team and a league. And through that process, I just kind of, um, I guess you could say, <laughs> finesse my way maybe into to a position with the, with the team. But essentially, just obviously, with the time with the, time with the, with the River Lions, I just kind of kept pestering Josh. Um, because I wanted to learn more. I want to know what this league was about because, again, someone who, who, who loves sport, who's always wanted to work in sport, um, I saw this as an opportunity to, to get ahead. So fast forward to, to 2018, um, Guelph, the Nighthawks, uh, myself, meeting Cameron, were the first two um, employees of the club um, with the team. And essentially, uh, the rest is kind of history, really. I mean, my time with the River Lions, it's, 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 it's short and brief, but essentially my time with the River Lions and, and being a part of the, the league and, you know, kind of, kind of my, kind of my chops, learning about the game, the operations kind of helped me progress to uh, direct a role with the club, um, helped get it off the ground um, through Cam's leadership. And then uh, as you'll hear from the rest of our panel, um, kind of the, the Nighthawks are, are, are born. So again, the Coles note version, but uh, it goes back to networking and kind of knowing um, being the right place at the right time and, and knowing the right people, I guess you could say. So that's just kind of how I got to where I am today. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, one of the things, and obviously, you know, from going, going through the program, we highlight this network and you have to make sure you're keeping your network up. So I really appreciate your connection there. Just a, this is a point of interest. Did, was basketball this, your sport uh, that you played growing up or was it, was basketball just sort of the context of sport that you landed in? Uh, it's, uh, basketball is, I mean, I love all sports. I've, I played all sports, soccer, basketball, rugby. Um, I would say my my preference of like where I am in life today, my, my favorite sport is probably soccer, but in terms of the best sport that I was actually good at was, was probably rugby, just playing provincially and so forth. So basketball is just kind of one of those things I would just liked because I love all sport, but uh, it just, for me, work, I always wanted to work on sport and this was an opportunity I couldn't turn down because I love basketball, but uh, I will say I probably prefer soccer more, but it's probably one A, one B, but the, the sport specific didn't really, have a, a say in whether or not um, I wanted to work in because I do a lot of I know a lot of people who want to work in their sport of choice um, but I will just say like that doesn't necessarily need to be 
off the hop. You can, you know, cut your chops in different industries because they're all kind of the same, yet a little bit different. Because I know just talking to other, I don't go on a tangent here, but be quick. I just know a lot of people who, who love a sport and they work in the sport, their desire for that sport kind of falls back and it's not the same. Um, just for some of my own friends who, um, who, who are in the industry um, kind of feel that way. So yeah, just basketball was kind of a, a love of mine, but wasn't, I needed to work in basketball, so to speak. Fantastic. Thank you. That's great. Nicole, can you give us a bit of a overview of your, your path? Yeah, I think uh, mine goes back to like a realization that you're not going to become a professional athlete. And I don't think that's necessarily because I'm a woman. I think it's just because I wasn't good enough. So it was like, how are you going to still do what you love? You know how people say, find something that you love to do for a living. And um, that led me to finding the the program at Brock. I actually did um, grade 13. Do we even still like refer to that? I don't even know if it's still a thing. Um, and I kind of used that year to play sports for free utilize my guidance counselor at my high school and then found this program and got in um during that time it was really and this is another one of those things just like the networking it was volunteer 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 um a friend of the panel scott mcroberts actually kind of got me that first role with the world juniors when they came to buffalo back in 2011 and just that was kind of the the thing for me it started there and major events was actually my focus pretty much through school because there just seemed to be a lot of opportunities that came up. Um, and even as you mentioned with um, with my master's, when I continued on, I actually took a break during that to work for the Pan Am games when they came to, to Toronto. Um, and so that's kind of, that's where I saw myself was, was big games, but I think it's kind of a nomadic lifestyle. And, you know, I, I ended up working after that um, with a baseball team. Cam always loves me to mention Portland Pickles because it's fun to Google. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, but even moving from that event interest into um, teams like the the Pickles and the Nighthawks is, I mean, you're putting on events every game day, right? Um, And even outside of that, so you can transfer those skills easily. Um, But the, the cool thing too about my path is just, I've actually been a part of the inaugural seasons of two different teams, um, which is both the Pickles and the Nighthawks. So a lot of people they just don't have that because, you know, franchises, even pro franchises and leagues like ours, they don't come along that often. I think maybe more so now there's a lot popping up, you know, with different leagues across uh, North America, but that's something that I I like to hang my hat on. So. Thanks, Nicole. I think they call it a victory lap now. It's not. Okay. (laughs) I couldn't remember that term, but yeah, Hey, it was. was There it is. Yeah, absolutely. And the pickles, that's funny you mentioned that too. And I'm glad you did. One one of the questions that we have listed here from one of the students asks about the pickles. So that'll come back oh, geez. up. Um, specifically. Oh, geez. Someone's doing some Googling. <laughs> <laughs> they must have looked at your LinkedIn page. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Cameron, can you tell us about your path? Yeah, absolutely. Somewhat similar to, to Dylan and Nicole. Um, I think I, I realized fairly early on um, as a massive sports fan as well uh, that playing sports was just not something that was uh, that was going to be um, part of my career path. So um, I was lucky to, to realize fairly early on in high school that um, the business of sports is where I wanted to be um, and, and went to, to Brock University, as you mentioned, Shannon. And uh, I think Brock really... Um, I feel like just set us up for success. The first work opportunity that I had, um, which included the pleasure of working with, with Shannon, um, was, was with Golf Canada. And, uh, and so kind of got my feet wet uh, working on putting on professional golf tournaments with, with Golf Canada for a number of years during the summers while I was at university. And, and that really kind of was the precipice for where my career path has, has gone in the sport world. Um, that was more of a sort of operational focus in, in terms of my role and responsibility in putting on those those tournaments. And I knew I wanted to, to diversify my skill set um, and get a little bit of a taste of everything to do with the sport business industry. And so from there, I ended up going and working with the Grey Cup Festival when it was in Toronto in 2007 uh, in a business development role and, and really helping fulfill the entire sort of festival uh, portion of, of the Grey Cup. Uh, and then I'm originally from Vancouver, ended up moving back to Vancouver for a number of years and and helped uh, reopen BC Place Stadium, which is the largest sports venue in uh, in the province of BC. 
Um, and so was really lucky to, to go through that renovation project and then help bring uh, new events into that renovated facility. So um, I've been blessed to have sort of a, a really sort of diverse background and, and skill set in the in the industry. And that sort of helped lead me to uh, now taking on this role in, in leading the Guelph Nighthawks, getting our team off the ground and, and ultimately to where we are today. Uh, this is what I'm loving about what everyone is saying is highlighting for students the, the different areas of sport management. We often focus on one specific space, but really there are so many areas once you dig into the program and then get out into the industry that you can maybe, maybe you never even thought of when you entered first year university that that was even a possibility in this field of sport management. So I, I really appreciate that connection. Um, so the next few questions are going to focus on your connection to the Nighthawks. So what you do on a daily basis, some of the things that might impact you as, um, as you work through your roles. Um, this is a bit um, of a generic question, but it's one that had come from when we were talking to the students some we're interested in. So um, this is where um, you may not be able to speak specifically to it because it has to do with the athletes, but if you have any, um, any information, we'd love to hear. So from your knowledge of the athletes that you manage, can you speak to the value of attending Canadian versus American institutions in terms of the players now that um, are coming to the Nighthawks team? Um, again, you may not be able to speak to that, but do you have any insight in terms of the value of those playing experiences leading your players to the Nighthawks? Yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can take a shot at that, Shannon. Um, I mean, I, I think... Like I, I talk to our players all the time about it, it's um, for them. It's about opportunity um, and it's finding the right place that is going to give you the best opportunity. Um, if from an athlete perspective to get playing time on the court, to be able to showcase yourself uh, and contribute to, to a winning team. Um, if it's from an education perspective, it's about making sure that you go, uh, that you have the right opportunity again um, to, to go into the field that you want to pursue outside of athletics. Um, and, and so I, I think often athletes, um, just like all of us do, we see the cachet talking about the basketball world of, I want to go play for Duke. I want to go play for North Carolina. I want to go play for one of these top programs, but the opportunity might not be there for the athlete. They might get three minutes of playing time in a game and that's not giving them the chance to showcase themselves um, where it, it might be that playing for, um, what is perceived as a lesser school um, actually allows a player more playing time. You look at a guy like a Steph Curry who went to Davidson a, as an example um, and, and got all the playing time that he needed that led to him being a top 10 draft pick in, in the NBA and, and put him on the path to where he is today. So it's really about finding the right people and the right opportunity that could be at a Canadian institution that could be at an American institution. I think some of our athletes have shown that you don't have to go to American school the right opportunity exists here in our country, um, then by all means pursue it. If you have the right relationship with that coach, um, then that can put you on a path to playing professional basketball in the CBL. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just piggyback on that real quick as well. It, uh, again, not speaking from my own personal experience because I didn't have the opportunity to consider it either or, but I would just say, I think if this is kind of a targeted question from one of your students, it's, um, I think it comes down to the kind, of, the kind of experience you want to have, right? Like pandemic aside, you only live in your early twenties once, right? And I say that in the sense of, if you want to explore, you want to, you know, live abroad, you want to experience a different culture, it's a different environment, you know, like Southern Ontario is relatively the same, whether you're in Niagara or London or up in Ottawa, uh, just across the province. But if it's, again, just looking to see what's out there or again like Cameron said a lot of us are kind of jaded by some of the larger programs but there are plenty of other division one school d2 schools in middle of nowhere you know Arkansas which that experience on a, on a lacrosse team would be so different from you know playing in a lacrosse team in, in Guelph um, and you'll be able to look back look back on that experience thinking yeah you know what um, I got out of my you know comfort zone I'm in a different different state different country um, and you kind of, you know, force yourself to grow. And then obviously the other aspect is, is education. Um, I stress that a lot just because it's one of those things that growing up, um, that's probably was an area that I, that I focused much on in my, my own personal life. So I think education is a, is a key aspect where, um, we all know there's a life after playing, even if you are, um, you know, 
fortunate enough to, to make money playing a professional sport, um, where, like, what will you do once that's over with, right? So the education aspect is important. And I, I say this just because um, we're fortunate enough to have him on our team. We look at a Corey Johnson, Harvard grad, that Harvard education is going to do what is for him once he's done playing basketball. Again, you need to have the, the GPA to get into a Harvard, but he has set himself up for life after basketball through his education. So again, I would just say for me, again, not being in this scenario, I would just look at it from yourself. If you're looking in the mirror, um, experience and education are, are, are two things to, to strongly consider. Awesome. Nicole, any, any other points that you wanted to add? No, I mean, I think they uh, both Cam and Dylan said it well. I think for us in Canada, like the landscape is changing, right? I mean, there were there was a long time where people didn't even realize you could go down to the States and the hurdles that it took to do that were harder. So it's almost like the barriers there have decreased, but then education here has improved, right? And athletics has improved. So it's really like Cam had said, you kind of have to do what's what's best for you. But I think the CEBL is a great example too, that if you, you want to play professionally, at least in basketball, you know, you don't have to go somewhere else. Um, you know, our relationship with you sports is, is, is huge as well. So it's really, I think, personal preference and you, you have to do your due diligence to make sure you're making the right choice for yourself. Absolutely. And I think that's where it comes back to not just taking for granted assumptions. So a lot of people assume the NCAA experience is better, but better for who? And I like your emphasis on just figuring out what it is that individuals want and moving forward in that direction. And I appreciate, appreciate that commentary. So I'll move specifically now to some of your experiences. Um, and I'm sure you've had this question um, many times over the last year, but from a management perspective, so if we're looking at operations, and I'll move to more of the fan experience in the next question, but from an operational perspective, what are the biggest challenges manning and working through the pandemic? Loaded, loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> well, where, thing, where, where do you want to one, start? <laughs> yeah, no, the one thing, and I'll, I'll give you guys this word, like the one thing I wrote down thinking about this was is uncertainty too vague of a term? Like that's the thing that, that's what pops up, uncertainty. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean, for me right now, even not managing a team, but just, it's just lack of control. I've never been not in control of everything in my life. And this is just a spinning of no control, <laughs> but I'll let no, you I, go, go ahead. I, I, I'm, the, I'm the same way, I'm, I'm very controlling, so. But it's, again, it's basically goes down to deal, rolling with the punches as well, right? So again, for, for us, this time last year, there were just, you know, the unknowns were through the roof, right? We were preparing for our second season. We were sky high. Everything was moving in the right direction. And then bang, just like that, the whole world stops. But in terms of how we've kind of overcome it and some of the, you know, the operational and the management side of things of dealing with the pandemic, it, I would just say it's, it's a yes, dealing with what's being thrown our way, but at the same time, making the most of the current situation. So there were a lot of unknowns in terms of what does that mean for our staff? What does it mean for our season? What does, it mean, what does that mean for just our day-to-day -day lives, right? Especially being a new league, uh, going into our second season, there were just things out of our control. But what we were able to do is kind of, kind of set back and obviously by having an ownership group and, and a league office that was ready to ride this thing out, we were able to kind of come through the other side and and when it came to our summer series we were able to to kind of put some together that a lot of other sports teams weren't able to do um especially here here in canada again you just look at the cfl they they, they lost the season hockey they weren't able to pick up and, and and carry on so for us in terms of the challenges we were facing is just what do we do for for our, our ticket base not i mean more more importantly what do we do for our own staff um and then as, again this goes without saying, but I'll say anyways, just the, the safety and concerns that a lot of us have with the pandemic is just how do we manage that? Because when it comes to the day-to-day -day and putting on the summer series, and I'll let, you know, Nicole and Cameron answer that part of this, um, there were a lot to it in terms of, you know, daily screenings, testing, you know, the smaller things are just cleaning basketballs before and after every practice. Like there's just a lot of like managerial things that, um, again, even player arrivals, quarantining for out of, out of country guys. So there's a lot that, happened and a lot of things we had to manage but i think where we are today we've been able to learn on that data and kind of set ourselves up for 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 the future but like i said i'll let cameron and and, and nicole share more uh, from their own experiences as well 
Yeah, I think the the word of the pandemic um, for me has been pivot. Um, you have to be flexible and you have to pivot and you have to change and you have to, we have to change our business model to be able to continue on. And, and that's no different from any other industry. Um, we in the sports world have obviously been significantly impacted. Our, our biggest challenge is that we don't have our typical revenue streams coming in. Um, our main revenue stream as an organization is through ticket sales. And obviously we haven't been able to put people into, into an arena. And so that's been our, our single biggest challenge is how do we continue along without that revenue stream? And, and we've been able to sort of counterbalance that with, um, with broadcast and marketing opportunities. When we returned in the summer of 2020, we were able to do so partly because we had a national broadcast deal with CBC. We were one of the first leagues to return to play. Uh, we were the first league to return to play in this country. And it gave us a unique platform to be able to showcase ourselves in a way that we never would have been able to otherwise. So yes, we incurred in costs doing that, but the ability for us to, to market and promote our league um, was um, was one that we just couldn't pass up. And so that's how we kind of pivoted and overcame that challenge of not having uh, that regular revenue stream from ticket sales uh, come in. Awesome, thank you. Nicole, did you want to jump in? I was going to follow up with Cameron, but I can get you to jump in there too if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, my my role in the organization is, is different in terms of really being that first point of contact with the fans. Um, and so when you think of the word challenge in terms of that it was the fear of what are they going to say you know are they going to want a refund what does this look like because this time last year nobody this was the first time we were all doing it right it was do we have to refund or what does that look like and that's kind of the word we try to avoid in the organization right so um we were fortunate enough in terms of being able to retain over 80 percent of our our season ticket member base um, and that's a credit to myself and my colleague Brent because the challenge was having those conversations. And I remember making calls in March of 2020 and telling people like, hey, you know, we're just checking in. You remember when we all got those first wave of COVID emails from like every company that wanted you to make sure that they were thinking about you? Well, we we made phone calls because we really try to, you know, with customer service be be at a top level. And it was interesting because at that time people were like, oh, we're we're going to have a season. Everything's going to be good. And obviously day by day, everything changes and still continues to change. Um, but the, the point I try to bring across to fans when I'm having those conversations and even businesses, when I'm talking to them now is that people have a preconceived notion of what our team is like, Oh, you're a pro team. Like you must have a lot of money. You must be doing well. And it's like, well, we're still a startup and we've still been impacted by the pandemic, just like you. Um, and even when people were, I mean, we, we can't forget all those that have passed away and have been impacted by this virus in different ways. So when I was calling to talk to people about basketball, uh, that, that wasn't necessarily the top of their mind because they had a thousand other things. Um, so I would always just tell them, you know, fans are the most important thing to us. So we just want to touch base with you. And it was just making sure they understood where we were coming from. It was, it was challenging, but I'm really happy with where we ended up and where we're headed into this year. So. I'm going to come back to that when we talk about this 80% and what you what how you connect with the, with them specifically but Cameron coming back to you so being the president of this you're looking at this club you're looking at having your team you have a, a staff that you're responsible for in sport we we think of sport as a competitive space but who are you leaning on to cooperate with to get some of these pivot ideas so i mean you're not functioning and i know you well so you're a social very connected person is to say, like, who do you lean on for mentorship during this, like, what do I do kind of moment, I, if anyone, but I'm assuming there's probably a few. Yeah, I mean, truth be told, that's where I lean on a lot of my past experience in terms of teams that I've worked with in the past, leaders that I've worked with in the past at other teams and organizations, seeing what they've done that has worked and also seeing what they've done that hasn't worked and, and trying to sort of pick and choose hopefully the right ways that they've either been able to pivot or the right things that they have done in the past and and bring those here look i i'll be the first to admit i don't have all the answers i'm never going to that's why you build a great team around you and hopefully you can lean on some of those past experiences um i i will be the first to admit you big borrow and steal um and and you see what has worked and, and you take some of those great ideas and implement them to scale based on the organization that that you work for and so um i mean nicole mentioned it a bit in terms of customer service and how we've taken care of our fans through this 
um, in terms of not having fans in, in arena, we've always tried to make sure that we, that we continue to have that relationship with our fans, um, but just do it in a different way, whether it be um, now running sort of virtual town halls as we're planning to do for this upcoming season, knowing that we can't run a season ticket holder launch party like we'd want to do live with our players and our fans and all that in attendance. So now we pivot and we, and we, and we take that virtual. So instead of doing nothing, we try and find sort of the best way with the tools that we have um, to be able to bring something like that to life. So, um, so yeah, I mean, always looking at best practices of, of what others are doing um, is, is a huge resource in, in terms of how we go about sort of um, working through this pandemic. Shannon, if, if I could add one of the best things about this year for me as a sport professional has been, there are so many webinars and networking opportunities with people across North America. Like, you know, I've talked to people with the Warriors. I've talked to people with the Chicago Blackhawks. Like it's, you, you can make these connections that you wouldn't have necessarily been able to before. And then you take these ideas and you implement them in your markets. And I think before there might've been a oh, we want to keep all of our great ideas to ourselves, right? Like there was trying to protect those proprietary things, but it's just been great just to talk with other people and, and figure out, like Cam said, what works and what doesn't in your market, so. Yeah, so using that as an opportunity, even though obviously there's a lot of things that have not been opportunities, but that's a great way to leverage some, some ideas in this space. So building from that, Nicole, and Dylan, too, you can jump in here. So what are some of the ideas that you've now brought to the table? We've heard a few in terms of the town hall and how you're like personalized phone calls to connect with fans. But how are you maintaining that fan experience in this whole new world in terms of what experience even means? Um, can you speak to a few of those um, ideas? Yeah, and Nicole, why don't you start with just where we were this time of year when we rolled out our retention plan and like the level of customer service? Um, that you and Brent provide again, like I, it's going to sound biased, but we do have the best staff in, in our league. And, uh, I think it's, it's proof in the, like the calls that over 80% retention, uh, it's, a, it's even higher, but, um, just again, Nicole, just speak of the process and how we always value and camera mentions as well. Customer service is number one. Um, so just speak on that process and, and how that went, uh, last year. Yeah, it's hard to even because so much has happened in in the past year. Like we we actually jumped into retentions around June because that was the time where we finally realized, you know, there's no no traditional season is going to take place with fans. And so it really was just, okay, this is what we're going to provide. It was a great package with, you know, more discounts and and gifts and that sort of thing to make sure they valued staying with the club. Ultimately, we don't have a huge venue. Um, and so securing your seat was very huge for us as well because if you were to refund your money you were going to lose that great seat that you had and that's become even more interesting in a social distance world where you know if you if you lose your place in line I think that played a lot into it but overall the people that were Nighthawks fans already Nighthawk season ticket members or any ticket holders they there was a reason for that like they were invested they they cared about our team and they wanted to stick with us and when the, this question came about when in terms of how are we continuing to keep them engaged so that retention was a huge part of it. Um, we did do an outdoor season ticker appreciation party in August, yeah. obviously August was a different time. Um, you know, we were still wearing masks, we still had all the precautions we were outside. Um, we utilized a partner's location in the parking lot. Um, and so it's, you can still be creative and think outside and fans really did appreciate that. They got to come down. We, we had a bit of a locker room sale. Um, so they got some exclusive gear. And um, that was one thing that really stands out that we've done in the past year. But it's interesting for us at the Nighthawks, we were still new. I know I've mentioned this a few times, but those other teams that I mentioned, I mean, if you're Toronto Maple Leafs fan you've been a Toronto Maple Leafs fan your whole life and so they don't have to do as much to keep that fan base whereas we really have to stay in contact with our fans you know we do a lot of contesting um, and it's now that we're kind of staring down the barrel again of probably not getting together we're continuing to try and kind of find these ideas um, to keep them engaged so exactly and and just to kind of build on the the experience side of things because um we, we focus on, a lot on, you know, money can't buy opportunities. And so what Nicole was referencing in terms of exclusivity, we, we focus on, you know, exclusive access, you know, again, for a season ticket base, uh, we did have some items on sale that, you know, player apparel that general public wouldn't have access to. Um, we have, you know, a few upcoming like launches of behind the scene content. 
Uh, we do that with our night vision series. Uh, again, when we go on sale with our with our new specific line, we're providing exclusive opportunities to our season ticket base. And then as well as uh, a kind of a, a expansion on our, on our night vision um, series this time last year, um, Shelby, who's in on the call right now, but our, our, our director of marketing communication, her and Cameron put together our a, a video series just to kind of showing the behind the scenes access of, of, of what it's like to be a, a Nighthawk player, a uh, Nighthawk organization. So again, for us, it's just continuing to, to have those opportunities that money can't buy um, because they are unique and they're, and they're special. And for us, it's kind of how we build, build that brand affinity with, with the club, because like Nicole mentioned, we are new. I mean, we've, we've only played in Guelph for one season. So again, there's still work on us to kind of build up that, uh, that, that fan base, if you will. So this season, we're definitely looking exciting. We're excited for it. So it, it's how can we do more when we have our players in town, our staff in town, and what can we do with the parameters around? So again, hopefully more outdoor uh, activities, uh, more viewing parties, and just kind of you know hyping the city up uh, with Nighthawks basketball. Just knowing that last year was was exciting for us because we were able to play and have another season under our belt. But for those who actually live in Guelph, there's kind of that disconnect because we were in St. Catharines for the summer series. So this year it's about, you know, building on, on those experiences. And uh, like I said, money can't buy opportunities. It sounds like you're, you're making them feel valued. Like to have someone, a personal phone call, you value them as an individual and as a fan. That's really important. Sorry, Cameron, I interrupted you there. Yeah, no, I was going to basically echo those, those sentiments is um, I probably shouldn't say this with, with Dylan and Nicole on here, but I'm going to anyways, is we can put all the benefits out that we want for, for our ticket holders and for our customers. At the end of the day, it's about the relationship. Nicole and Brent and Dylan have done such a good job of building and developing a strong relationship with our ticket holders that I think that our, our customers even feel like they have just a vested interest in the relationship with them just as much as with the club. And because of that, they don't want to leave that relationship. And, and so um, truth be told, like you, I, we could have no benefits for them. And I'm certain our numbers would be similarly as strong because of those relationships that we have with our customers. So, I mean, if, um, if anyone can take anything away from this, it is about building and maintaining strong relationships, whether you're in the sports industry or, or, or out elsewhere. Um, those relationships are such a critical part to your own personal success. I'm uh, Shannon. I'm actually a season ticket holder of a team. And we, we talk about this in a lot of our own internal meetings because I get to see both sides of it. So it's the service that I'm provided and then the service that I provide. Um, and so it's just trying to set yourself apart. I mean, Guelph's interesting. Like there's, there's obviously an OHL team there um, and we can't speak to their operations because we're not involved in any way, but um, you know, you're just trying to compare it to all the teams across the country in North America, like Cam said, step up that service to set yourself apart because people do have choices on where they can spend their money. Right. So you have to, again, set yourself apart. And it's a smart way to go. I, this is where you, we talked about right from the start, we said we're in sport business. Like this is part of what I'm talking about your career. But if you come back to the foundation of why people engage in sport is because they want this sense of community. They want to be with other people. They want that competition, but they also want to feel like they're a part of something. And so you are taking the steps to say you are a part of something. And I think that's really uh, such a great message. So that, all, that leads into, I'm mindful of your time. Um, the last question is, what piece of advice do you have for individuals who are looking to work in the sport industry? I think we've touched on some of that throughout this, but just if you had this little elevator pitch of what do you need to do in order to be successful at where you are? Um, I'll start on the bottom, so I'll start with Cameron. Sure. You're the bottom of my um, screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, so I would say there's a couple of different comments that I have there. I, I just mentioned relationships. I'll, I'll go back to that relationships, your network, building a network of strong connections that you can rely upon. That's how I've been able to get to where I am. I, I ultimately got into this role as the president of the Guelph Nighthawks because I had a relationship with Mike Morreale, who's the commissioner and CEO of our league, going back to the 2007 Grey Cup. We worked um, with the Players Association with the CFL um, in putting on their events around the Grey Cup. And when I moved back to southwestern Ontario and the CEBL was launching, I reconnected with him and, and we had a couple lunches and, and ultimately I ended up in, in the position that, that I am. Um, so those relationships are really key. The other point that I want to make is um, in terms of 
post-secondary education and sort of where you decide to go and also where you want to go in, in your career following your post-secondary education. Um, I, I think it's really important to identify do you know what you want to do at this point? Or um, are you looking to sort of test the waters and try sort of a number of different sort of um, professions within the industry that you want to get into? Uh, as an example, in, in the sports industry, I knew fairly early on that I had no idea where I wanted to go in the sports industry. I didn't know if I wanted to go into the law side of things. I didn't know if I wanted to go into marketing, sponsorship, um, business development or what. And so I, I try to sort of test the waters and, and get some work opportunities in each one of those uh, different facets um, to figure out where, where it was that I wanted to ultimately go. It led me down more of a business development type of path, um, which got me to the position that, that I'm in today. Um, but I think it's really important to that you don't need to have all the answers right now, but to test the waters, figure out what you enjoy. And then once you know what you enjoy, go after it and pursue it. That's great. When we're coming back to, there's so many options. I mean, I think some students come in really narrow. I'm, I'm going to be in sport marketing. And then just like, there's so many places that you can land and just being open to those experiences, even being a bit more pigeonholed to say what sport or what team they want to work for. This is yeah. like, come in this eyes wide open. I think that's They great. all want to be the GM of the leaf, Shannon. That's the <laughs> <laughs> this, this is true and there's only one and he's, I was, he's but we've proven it can be done so now it's the <laughs> absolutely so nicole that leads me to you so and this can be advice or evidence wherever you want to land with that <laughs> no, particular mine, question. yeah what came to mind for me and something that i that i try to say is just be be a sponge wherever you are so i've interacted with a lot of interns throughout my time in portland and even here with the nighthawks you know we just had a good group that's leaving us now and they've had a unique internship experience with it never meeting us in person basically um but you you have to take what you can from each experience so all those volunteering that you do you know try to step up and just ask you know how you can help and lend a hand and even if it's in a department or a task that you might not enjoy or might not have interest in and I always used to tell the the interns in Portland you know if you see something being done here and you don't agree with it or it wouldn't be a way that you would do things you know take that with you and make that change in your next role and and you know it's not always easy to kind of talk to your superiors when you're in an internship um, you know if you want to see those changes but it's all about taking it in because you're going to eventually be in that position yourself. You're going to have interns that are um, in your organization as well. So it's just finding those things that interest you and, and being a sponge is what came to mind for me. So. Absolutely. And be present in those experiences. So it's, you're an intern, so that's meant to be a learning experience. Absolutely. I, like I actually uh, remember one of my first um, tutorials in, in at Brock where the TA was, his internship was like in the mail room with the Raptors. And it's like, all he did was answer like the autograph requests and stuff like that, right? And it seems like a small thing, but that's a huge organization. And even with the interns that we've had that are just leaving us, it's like every little thing that you do, it helps the organization. Um, so it's definitely on uh, individuals like Cam, Dylan and myself who are in these positions to show the appreciation too, because you don't want them to, don't get discouraged early on, I guess would be the other piece of advice. Like it's gonna take some time to find your place the sport industry is not huge, especially in Southern Ontario. I mean, it's getting bigger. Um, so you just have to make those connections as well, right? Which is the, the networking uh, tip. Absolutely. Thanks, Nicole. Dylan, any final thoughts on advice? Uh, let's just kind of wrap up do it in a bow because, you know, Cameron and Nicole have hit the nail on the head. I would just, again, say, because I, again, seeing this and obviously being in, in that position before, you have to be a sponge, you have to be a yes person, and you just have to make the most of your opportunities. Um, and I would say just don't don't wait, don't hold back. Again, for if you're whether you're first year or fourth year, there are so many opportunities out there, especially in sport, because we know um, positions are few and far between, but there are always volunteer opportunities, um, regardless of the organization, whether you're putting on, you know, single event tournaments, or you're helping throughout a season with us, or or what have you, you know, sport organizations are always looking for volunteers and start early. And when you're in that position or in that volunteer opportunity, work hard, be a yes person, because you know what, just because you may not get it, the gratitude that you think you may deserve during that shift, it's still being uh, watched. And it's, you know, you know, who, who works hard, um, whether or not you're, you know, getting the pat on the back. So, cause you never know where that's going to lead to. 
So I won't, like, again, sponge education, you know, following along, all that stuff, networking is all true, but I would just stress when you're in the position, whether it's volunteering um, or internship, just work hard, soak up as much as you, as much as you possibly can. And uh, just know you don't know all the answers, even if, even if you are an intern, right? Again, you're here to help out and grow because like Nicole said, you're going to learn what, or learn what you learn in this organization. And if you didn't like it, or you think you could do it better, A, speak up when you're in that current internship, but down the road, you're going to build upon that because that's kind of what Cam said earlier, beg, borrow and steal, because you can just continue to grow on your, on your experiences. So just work hard and uh, put yourself out there is what I would say. And uh, this is, I'm going to wrap that and then turn it into a question that is for Cameron specifically, because I'm going to tie it into the Gulf Canada experience, which is part of the question. Um, so knowing that, I mean, working with you in, um, at that time, Royal Canadian Golf Association, we're in a, we were in a role that was labor intensive. And so maybe isn't the most attractive position for someone to be in, but you're, sta- you're in front of your front facing sponsor executives, those that are on the board at Royal, the Gulf Canada now. And those are, if you're not working hard in that space, those people are watching. So it, it comes back to your point, Dylan, of always giving 110% knowing that you're around people, especially if you're in the event space, that are potential employers in the future and you know, want to make sure that you're leveraging those experiences. So that leads into one of the students asked, Cameron, it says, recognizing you had an intern ex- internship experience, do you draw on any of that when you're now in your current role? So it's almost that progression question of saying, do you use what you've developed along the way in now being the president of the Nighthawks? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think Nicole said it well, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, in, in that um, really you, you kind of, you learn a lot in the organizations that you work for. Um, you, you learn a lot about what you like, what you don't like in, in terms of how people manage you, in terms of how people are, what the culture is of an organization and, and um, where you want to be as a leader and the type of organization you want to have. So I, I lean on all of those experiences and pick and choose what I like and, and kind of throw away the stuff that I didn't really like and apply them, apply them here. So, I mean, the, the the path to getting to wherever it is that you end up, that is a huge contributor to, I think, um, sort of the type of organization uh, and and the type of culture that you want to build within an organization. I, I, I won't say the organization, but I, I had one experience in, in my career um, with, with a leader who was incredibly intense. Um, and uh, it wasn't in my time with with Shannon. I promise that at, at Golf Canada, but incredibly intense. And it just it, it wasn't an enjoyable experience. Uh, we did a heck of a lot. We we progressed as an organization, but it just wasn't enjoyable. And so I kind of learned, especially through that experience, that I didn't want our staff in Guelph to feel like they were on pins and needles coming into work every day. Um, I, I wanted them to enjoy their time here. To, to build a good sort of transparent and enjoyable sort of fun culture within our organization. And through that, we're going to enjoy our time together and uh, build upon that and, and lead ourselves to, to success. So um, so to very long way of answering. Yes. Um, past experience definitely builds you to, uh, to where you are today. Focus. And it sounds it's consistent across what you're saying, you've been saying across this hour is it's the focus on relationships, not only with your clients and your customers and the, the fan base, but also y- you all as an organization. And that that is if you tap into that word culture that, you know, we talk about in our program is it's creating a culture that's focused on relationships. And when it's a strong culture, it filters through everything. And I really um I, I appreciate that comment. And that's something that you've learned. So you know what you like and don't like based on the experiences that you've had before. If um, I could just say one other thing, Shannon, yeah. just about culture and, and sort of figuring out where it is that you want to go in your career is as you in, in eventually have opportunities presented in front of you, um, especially early on in your career. If I could say this, it is 
so much less about the organization that you work for um, as it is about the person or the people that you are working for um, and learning from those people, finding the right mentors that are going to help you build and grow in the way that you want to grow. You can go work for the MLSEs and the OSEGs of the world. There's nothing against them. Um, but really what is important is finding the right people that are going to help you grow individually and get you on the path that you want to be on in your career. So if you don't, you feel like you don't enjoy the people that you're working with or the people that you report to might not be the right opportunity, even though that organization is what you um, have pursued. So I just wanted to make that, uh, that point. Awesome. And great, great piece of advice. Yes, Nicole. Sorry, if I could, going back to relationships and how I mentioned the size of the industry, you can't afford to have a bad interaction because that can easily follow you because of the size of this industry, right? So, you know, it, obviously it takes a lot for someone to make a, a horrible impression, but, you know, if you do what Dylan and I were mentioning and, and really work hard, that will travel just as fast, right? In terms of all those connections that you're going to make. So, such a good point. As you say, it's just like people talk and people are connected. So, yeah, absolutely, making the best of it. So I'm, I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to collapse these two questions. Hopefully I do it effectively for what the students are looking for. So both, there was questions for Dylan and Nicole about your post-secondary. So I'm gonna kind of flip them around because Nicole, you have your master's and then Dylan, you had done um, a diploma program prior to coming to Brock for the sport management program. So I'm gonna combine the questions sort of, I'm hoping I do this justice. How, what was the benefit of those, um, the extra step in terms of your university career? So I know Dylan, yours came up before you kind of flipped in terms of having Nicole's was after her undergrad, she did mm -hmm. her graduate studies, but what's the benefit of that experience um, in your mind? I, I think for me, I think the benefit is just knowing who you are as an individual. I mean, I'd say I went to school again. I mean, I'll be completely honest. I actually knew about the sport management program when I graduated high school in 2009. The reality of the situation was I didn't have the grades. And you know what? It just meant I took a longer process because for me, where I wanted to be was in sport and I want to be a sportscaster. I want to be the next, next, you know, Michael Wilbon, which is why I went the TV route. But for me, as I, you know, was going through my, my mid twenties, um, it was just trying to, you know, figure out what I wanted to do in life. I had a, a bunch of other experiences again tv side working for the Ottawa senators in that regard but then i also spent a time in my life you know working construction being a, leading a, a crew of 20 people um building highways and yet i found myself back at school at, at brock because for me who who i wanted to be excuse me uh, as an individual was someone who was in sports with a post-secondary degree so in terms of how it kind of shaped to kind of where i am it goes upon what cameron was mentioning in terms of like the experience of being an intern for me, I draw upon all the experience I've had from all walks of life and and how that has kind of helped me today. Because when I, I would say when I was at Brock doing my 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 undergrad, I was a lot more attentive than I was when I was, you know, 18, 19 coming out of school the first time around. Because for me, where I was in my life, I knew what Brock was going to do for me and I knew what I wanted to get out of Brock, as selfishly as that is. So for me, as again, you know, sitting in the front of the class, <laughs> you know. You'll get to learn Christy Spence, get to learn, you know, Dr. Cousins, you know, two, two individuals. And even now yourself, Shannon, just, I get to, you know, build upon those relationships because again, when I was 18, 19, I wasn't thinking like that. So for Brock and the kind of what it's meant for me and the kind of where it's helped me, it's just kind of, you know, it's propelled me to the life that I, I've always wanted to have. And again, it's, I look upon it fondly, even though it was two years, um, because like I said, it's put me in the situation to, to, to move ahead and grow as an individual. So again, it isn't, it's not, not everyone needs the, you know, direct structure, but like I will say, it's just a matter of what you do when you're in that scenario and when you're in the moment. And like I said, it goes back to my earlier comment of just making the most of it and just working hard because you never know where it will lead you. Fantastic, thanks Dylan. So I'll draw to you, Nicole, and the, the specific question for you was how your master's contributed to your, your role with the Pickles um, being a startup organization. So. Um, anything that you want to say in that in that space, but it's similarly in terms of how um, the second degree helped. Yeah, it's interesting, even with Dylan's comments of the, his the difference in his path. I mean, the program at Brock has become more competitive. So even those that are getting in right now, like the, the requirements compared to when any of us were um, 
we're accepted, it's much different, right? And that's not a bad thing because we want to make sure as professionals who are now working in the industry that we're getting great talent that's coming out of um, post-secondary. So in terms of my master's degree, interestingly, it's not something that I talk about that much. I kind of feel like it's it's there. It's it's not the diploma that's on the wall. I don't even, it's sitting somewhere, but it doesn't lessen what it did for me. I think for a master's degree is not for everybody. That would be my main piece of advice. Um, it was a great opportunity at Brock because you had the relationships and there was a ton of collaboration and we used to meet with, with all professors, all students that were in the program and we got to share ideas. And it was just a great experience where I learned, I would say the main difference between the undergrad and the graduate degree was I learned more about myself getting my master's degree than I did during my undergrad. I mean, your undergrad, you want to have fun. You're, you're going to learn a lot of stuff. Um, but when you're doing a thesis, like it takes a lot of work, um, not just in terms of academic writing, it's just, you know, it's just not for everyone. That's kind of the way I put it. So make sure you're talking to your professors and see if it's, I know we've said this a lot throughout the hour is a right fit for you. I do maintain that it was for me. I think something to think about is that you, you are entering the workforce a few years after, um, your cohorts. Um, so that was something I definitely thought about once I was done. I was like, oh, okay, like my friends have now had jobs for a few years now and I've still been studying. So that's interesting. It kind of depends on the state of the industry. Um, but tying that into my work, my master's thesis was, was focused on major events. So I actually spoke to a lot of event professionals. And then that really came down to when we were starting a team and having games, something I still to do to this day and I tell interns is, sit down and think, all right, if the season started tomorrow, what, what do we have? Like, do we have ticket stock? Do we have scanners to scan the tickets, you know, are tickets on sale so people can buy them? Like it's, you have to sit down and really think about it step by step. And that's what I did in my thesis by talking to these professionals who worked in a number of different events and a number of different sports. And then when I got to Portland, it was trying to pull all those things together um, and, and make it all come come to fruition, which it did. And they're, they're still doing that now without me uh, very successfully. So. <laughs> awesome. I, I, I appreciate the perspective and really very truly because you're doing a thesis based masters as well. That's something that someone needs to consider and whether that that's a right fit for them. So very much appreciated. So I see we're coming at the time now and I do, I will apologize formally on this space. I did not get to all of the questions, um, but we've just highlighted how important it is to network. So if your question was not addressed, I do encourage you to connect with any of the panelists with your question. Um, that's a good way to open the door to conversation. So um, I will leave that and again, apologize for not getting to all of them, but this was certainly a fantastic dialogue and I truly appreciate all three of your time. I know it's really valuable right now as you're coming up um, to engaging with fans and being involved in a season. So I really appreciate your time. Um, and I will end the recording, but we will also say go Nighthawks. So we'll 